Amongst all the scourges that we are facing in trying to be godly in this age, and uh, many of you would agree this is a very difficult age to live a godly life, God seems to have provided uh, proportionately some things to guide us and to strengthen us in our faith. And one of them is Bible prophecy. One of them is to allow us to see things that are happening that we have never seen before. And there may be a few of you here, I hope there would be quite a few of you here actually had been paying attention to the news back maybe 20 years ago. And remember the, the word perestroika and glasnos? These were the two words that we heard so much when the Soviet Union fell and the Russian Federation arose on uh, the ruins of it. And they were words that seemed to illustrate there was going to be a different way in which the economy would be run, and when there has been, and that there would be an openness in Russian society, which uh, maybe not quite as successful in, in doing that. The other thing that I think uh, is very important to understand is that there's a new word out there. And this new word relates to things that have happened since 2014. It's called Mascaranka. And that word is a word of, of sort of doctrine on, and strategy on the battlefield. And it's based on disinformation. It's on trying to deceive the enemy. It's on trying to take advantage of the enemy when they're trying to figure out what you're doing. And there's many witnesses of that in our, to, our world today of where it would seem that the, the uh, Russian army and the uh, Russian armed forces in general have taken advantage of the fact that people have gone for these things that they have said. It put disinformation in the news, information that has confused people about what is really going on. And uh, people have brought in, bought into it, and it's really allowed them to advance their case in society. One of the things which uh, I have experienced myself is uh, sort of the advancement of Russia in the world in my own lifetime. And I can remember making some charts that we used in a lecture tour back in the 60s where we were dealing with the Soviet Union. We were dealing with the Warsaw Pact. We were dealing with a division of Europe which we only really thought would ever fall by military uh, intervention. We did never imagine. And I can't remember ever reading in any Christadelphian publication uh, recently, and, uh, you know, around the time that it fell, it was about 1991. I can't remember anyone that anticipated that Europe would fall, or Western Europe, or Eastern Europe rather, would fall the way it did, and just sort of surrender to Western Europe, in many cases without a shot of a gun. And we had been expecting, we had been thinking, we had been speaking about this, this Russian advancement based on Ezekiel 38 and others, that it would come by an invasion, and it didn't turn out that way. Well, I'll tell you what it did to me. It told me just to be a little cautious in what you see in the world and the way you think that prophecy is going to lay, lay itself out in, in, uh, in view in time. Because things like that sometimes take a, a, a twist that we never foresaw. We read the chapter, we, chapter 38 and chapter 39, and basically, we have not had to change. That's one of the interesting things about it, because when the Soviet Union fell, a lot of people thought, well, we got it wrong. Russia must not be the nation that we think is going to do this work of Ezekiel 38 and 39. But it didn't take long before the Russian Federation got its act together, and Putin came on the scene. I mean, that was 1991, when the Russian Federation started, and uh, the president uh, President Putin came on the scene in the year 2000 and he's been steadily working at trying to strengthen Russia and uh, you know you sort of wonder what he may really have in mind when we know what God has in mind and another thing which has been a little hard to, to figure out too is what 
really the scriptures mean when it said that God would put hooks into his jaws. He'd turn them around, put hooks into his jaws, and draw him forward. So if that's not uh, happened, or that didn't happen with the change of the Soviet Union to the Russian Federation, and now with a man in the leadership, uh, very different than Gorbachev, very different than Yeltsin, very different, well, maybe not so different than Khrushchev and some of those others who were very military-minded. But this man seems to have a cunning associated with him and has made many statements which are, are misleading and which uh, some of the statesmen of the world have bought into. We really need to review and have in command why we believe Russia is this nation. And we get that from the the ancient world, that is the world that is described in Genesis chapter 10. Now, if you've seen this before, well, I'll just briefly go through it. Some of you may not have seen it, but the names that are given in Genesis 10, the sons of Japheth, seem to align so well with Ezekiel 38, it's far beyond coincidence that we find Magog, Gomer, Meshach, and Tubal, Togarma, Tarshish, all words that appear again in Ezekiel 38, and not in, in, not in that capacity or not in that number in a particular place anywhere else in the Bible. This is unique. So we feel quite confident that what God's pointing out is the sons of Japheth. Europe has some major role to play in this battle of the nations that come against Jerusalem. And that can be shown from some ancient maps and some ancient authorities. Now, I was going to choose, and I was going to put it on just to illustrate to you, the, the words that are found in the amplified version of the Bible, where they have put a lot of notes on this passage. You don't find them necessarily in, in other versions, English versions, but the amplified Bible has. And I'll just read them to you. It says that Gog is a symbolic name standing for the leader of the world powers antagonistic to God. I mean, these are just their interpretations, just a commentary on it. It says Meshach and Tubal are understood to have been the same as Mashi and Tiberani of the Greeks, tribes that inhabited the regions of the Caucasus. Rosh, which some would identify with Russia, must have designated a land and a people somewhere in the same quarter. And therefore, the Gog of Ezekiel must be viewed as, in some sense, the head of the high regions of the northwest of Asia. And he gets that from Fairburn's Imperial Standard Bible Encyclopedia. We notice that Gesenius, this is going on in the, in the same argument, Gesenius observes that it can scarcely be doubtful that the first trace of the Russians is here given. He gets that from Wang's commentary. Hengister, the Hengistenberg in 1802-1869 could not bear to see the poor Russians ranged among the enemies of the kingdom of God, but the one who gave Ezekiel this vision of what was to happen in the latter days. And he made no mistake in such a forecast as all the world can see today. Whoever was writing and the, the editors of the Amplified Bible really believed this idea. And what I wanted to illustrate by that is that this is not just a Christadelphian idea. It's not just something that is sort of loomed up in our literature and all of us uh, just bought into. There's a lot of background of other people who could see how Russia is mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And not the least of which is what Brother John Thomas wrote in Elpis Israel. And what he said uh, in page 381 this is, of course, written back in 1848 when he saw a completely different uh, government in Russia. You now there was uh, there there was there something that I'm going to mention uh, later on in some of the slides that you will see, <laughs> and uh, it illustrates how that that government that uh, made a lot of places and developed a lot of sites in in Israel and in Jerusalem is now demanding of the nation of Israel that they return them to Russia. Many of them have been returned to Russia. 
They have been furnished again to have the former glory, and uh, Russia seems to be quite happy with the fact of how they're being able to influence the Jewish leaders, the government of Israel, to themselves have a place in Jerusalem. Now, if you just look at some of the things, I don't expect there'd be too many people here could ever remember what happened in 1917. If there is, we should have a celebration. So, but 1917 of the history books tells us that there was a, a Russian revolution. In other words, the government was all overthrown. That was the one that basically the John, John Thomas talked about. And we saw that godless nation came in. When people my age were sort of going out in their 20s and their 30s to talk about this, we were looking at the Soviet Union. And we were looking at uh, a nation that developed these huge atomic weapons. It was kind of scary to even think about what they were capable of doing. But I don't think there was any event that was quite as eventful as 1957 when they flew that little satellite called Sputnik over this country. And that's when a lot of the Americans really freaked out because they were always worried about Russia having access to the skies of America. And now they had this little satellite that could fly right over the American continent and there was nothing that they could do about it. Now this man, I don't know if you've seen that picture in the news, but he's obviously a soldier, but he doesn't have any markings. You wouldn't know who he was, what nation he was fighting for, but uh, when he and a lot of others came on the border of the Ukraine, they didn't know what they were facing. By the time they knew what they were facing, there were so many of them, there wasn't much way in which they, they could uh, do much about it. That's where this Maskaranka comes from. And uh, this is what it means. And I couldn't remember all that, so I thought I would wait for the slide to come on. Russian history is filled with similar battles in which the country's troops have faked attacks or staged ambushes to defeat much larger opponents. They used fake tanks to mislead the Germans in a battle during the Second World War. They weren't tanks at all. They were just pieces of wood or pieces of cardboard that looks like tanks. That was the, the sort of the strategy behind it. So Maskaranka has since morphed into a geopolitical strategy for the Russians. But the, th the three elements involved remain the same. Distract your opponent, disguise what you're doing, and spread disinformation to sow confusion and delay a response. Now I'm quoting from Global News. This is, this is just the way the news is. I, I've had to hold off ever having a final copy of this until today. Because the news is just constantly coming in, and that's the age we live in. Like things are moving so fast in this direction now, that uh, we could expect what we've been looking for any time. It goes on to say, one need look no further than Russia's recent alleged actions in Crimea, Syria, the UK, and the US presidential election to see how effectively the Kremlin can influence other world powers while denying involvement all along. That's a very interesting strategy, and a strategy which is, is hard to deal with as we see uh, our, our world uh, scrambling around it. I wanted to draw your attention to this map. Now that was a, a map that was created for a campaign in the 60s. And it illustrates what we were talking about. This was created in Adelaide, Australia, and it was made for uh, a tour like the young people got together and on, the, on the floor of a house with someone who knew what, how to sort of sketch it in, and it was all laid out on the floor, and they had their, they, uh, once it was sketched out, the painters came in. It was all done by a group of young people who really thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, those kinds of things are just wonderful for building an ecclesia together and building, you know, the spirit that, that was behind some of the campaigns we held. So you can see in a, a few cases, we'd have to change the name. It was no longer the Soviet Union. We'd now call it the Russian Federation or just Russia. But you know, there's not much else we'd change. In 50 years of what's been going on and all the things that have happened in Russia, we really wouldn't have to change very much. I think that's a tribute to what uh, our brother uh, Thomas was able to write 
in Elpis Israel for many of us to read and many of us to see and investigate so that we ourselves were believers. In the 21st century, we've, we've written that up a little differently, but uh, basically it's the same ideas, except that we're able to see the nations involved a little clearer. We're able to see uh, not this east-west divide, but now sort of a north-south divide, which is different than it was in the 60s. And uh, we're able to talk about things through the history that's came since those, uh, those years when we first had to deal with it. So I just want to skip over this. We mentioned the ancient world. We mentioned that you could see these ancient maps that talked about those nations that developed out of the sons of Japheth. And then we come to see the prophecy about Russia. We need to know, if you've never seen this, it's, uh, it's very visible if you're keeping your King James Bible and you don't refer to any other Bible, you will not likely know, unless you've marked your margin, that the word prince, uh, sort of the word chief in the King James in verse 2 is translated as Rosh, as the name of a proper people in the RV and picked up by most modern translations. That yes, we can with, with some accuracy now see that Russia is mentioned in that verse 2. I did uh, go through those with you, so we'll go on to Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin and what happened in 1991, Gorbachev being a very unique person as a leader of Russia uh, who spoke in ways that we had never heard of any Russian leader ever speaking, sort of the, uh, the words of, of peace and the words of compromise. Uh, Mr. Yeltsin came on the scene and he, he wasn't really too much of a leader, there wasn't much happened under him. But uh, it did happen when Putin arrived. So the rise of latter-day Russia, and where I'd got to was in that little chart there, that in 1917, we saw the Russian Revolution, which brought the Soviet Union into place. 1957 was the year that Sputnik came across the skies in America. In uh, 1991, the Soviet Union fell and the Russian Federation arose. The year 2000 was the year that Putin first established as the president of the US, or not the USSR, but the Russian Federation. 2014, he invades Crimea. In 2015, he has a military base, naval base in Syria. 2017, he has air bases in Syria. Now you can just see by the pattern. This is very different than we ever witnessed in the, in the 60s or the 70s. We never saw this movement right towards the land. The uh, Russians with military bases and active participation. And now right on the border of Israel. All you have to do is just look at your news or read your news. Now these are the kinds of things, this, this little point I want to raise here, that I think that God reserves for you and I. The world wouldn't see it. They wouldn't note this. But in Ezekiel 39, verse 2, the ESV makes uh, mention of this in and, uh, and this particular way where it's, it's not an unusual translation. This is just what we understand the word means. I will turn you about, drive you forward, and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north and lead you against the mountains of Israel. Now, in the year 2007, the Russians had a, a sub, a mini-sub, that took the Russian flag and planted it on the North Pole. Now, that wasn't because the international community agreed that Russia could do this. This is just the attitude of the Russians. We're claiming the North Pole and our flag's on it if you went under sea to see it. Now, that's interesting because if you look at this, Russia from the uttermost parts of the north. This is what you see. If you take the city St. Petersburg, Russia, the longitude is 30 degrees east, the latitude 60 degrees north. Moscow, 37 degrees east, 55 degrees north. Uh, Sevaspool, Crimea, which is you know, one of the places where Russia went, 34 degrees east. Ankara, Turkey, some place where they're really interested in 
and we'll talk about that a little more, 32 degrees east. Latakia, where they have a military base in Syria, 35 degrees east. Beirut, Lebanon, where they're interested in what's going on there, 35 degrees east. Tel Aviv, 34 degrees east. Jerusalem, 35 degrees east. What other nation in the world could ever claim to be the king of the north? This country is coming from the uttermost parts of the north. You see, people would miss this unless you read your Bible and you see what the Bible is trying to tell us. That's how God is being merciful to us in this age where we have so many things going wrong. We can still have our faith. We can still believe what the Bible says. And we can see this. Russia is the guard, as it says in Ezekiel 38, verse 7. Be thou prepared. Prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Well, what does a guard mean? Well, that word's used quite often in the Bible, and it's got quite a, a you know, latitude of, of um, meaning. So it can mean a place of confinement, a prison, a guard, a jail, a post, a watch, an observance, or it can be a guard, a guard post, act of guarding, or observances. We always thought, at least I thought, and a group of brethren that we grew up with always thought that was a guard by hedging people in and not letting them out. But the work of President Putin seems to be an awful lot more subtle than that. Rather than moving into Crimea, uh, Crimea in a hostile way, he brings soldiers in that don't have any badges on them. They don't know where they've come from. He claims that there's so many people that speak Russia in Crimea, they need protecting. So he brings his people, his troops in to protect them. And when he's there, he quickly moves to make sure that no one can stop it because he brings in the military behind to support his movement. That's what we expected to see the subtlety of the movement of this nation from the north. Now, what we can't miss, brothers and sisters, is this is a work of God. All the way he works with people, like we've been reading, or we did read in Isaiah, with the work of Sennacherib, who thought he was doing this all, and God had to point out to him, if he ever read what was given to him, or heard what was given to him as a reply from God, you know, all these nations fell because their gods weren't gods. They were just work of, men and, of wood and stone. But you've chosen to tackle the great God, the God that is. So you can't miss the I in this. Ezekiel 38, verse 4, I will turn thee back, put hooks into thy jaws. I will bring thee forth and thine army. So however this man thinks or acts, or we think that there, it's just subtly this making all this happen. God's behind it. God says, I'll turn thee back. Now, I'm not sure what, I don't know if any of us could be sure, just what that really means. There's a number of things which appear to be the turning back, the putting hooks into their jaws and bringing them forth, but we may see something yet that would be more convincing. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them. Well, we know Persia is roughly re re represented by Iran, and whatever we hear in the news, and we've heard some recent things in the news this month that uh, Russia wants to put some distance between itself and Iran to sort of make the Israelis feel a little more comfortable. Yet uh, later news will illustrate, although they said they would do it, and they've had Netanyahu in Moscow talking to uh, Putin, it still appears that the Iranians are there and they're right on the borders of Israel. You'd never know what to believe with the news that you're hearing from those sources. I would just say that in my experience, I've, I've never found a better source for this than Brother Don Pierce's milestones and snippets. If you, if you wanted something to save you a lot of reading, uh, even though it is a lot of reading, because uh, he gives you a news update covering uh, the whole month by days. So you might get uh, one or two um, new 
episodes and, and updates, uh, you know, this week and get a couple next week. You might be away somewhere and then all of a sudden you get three, but you, you keep right up with the news with Brother Don Pierce. I'd rather be having a brother uh, sort of sort out the news that I read than just going through the, the news. I mean, that takes a lot of time and you really want to be efficient in that. But this man, whoever he may turn out to be, Gog of the land of Magog, we would expect to be closely associated with Russia and Germany. Now, we can't be certain because, uh, you know, we don't know exactly where Magog went or need to be certain where it went. Magog was up in that area uh, along with uh, Gomer and other of the sons of Japheth, and so we just leave it to the fact that it's in that general area. But it's an interesting thing to watch what's happening in the news right now as America, with all these tariffs that it's putting on the nations of the world, seems to be just offending one nation after another. Like Canada is very offended. And Canada doesn't usually get offended very easily, but they're very offended. So if, if uh, your president in, in America wants to put a tariff on our aluminum and our steel, uh, our Prime Minister, Mr. Trudeau, he's going to put one on ketchup. And uh, yeah, I don't know where this goes. It could even be humorous. <laughs> now you just look at what's reported in the, in the news. Putin sees an opening in Europe's fury with Trump. You see, and this is an illustration of how Russia is presently working. And they seem to be doing this because these events, these are events that are being reported on. Mr. Putin was now gaining considerable traction by casting himself as a reliable friend and trading partner to Europe, even as the Trump administration was treating its closest allies there as strategic and economic competitors. It is not our aim to divide anything or anybody in Europe, Mr. Putin said in a television interview before he went to Vienna. On the contrary, we want to see a united and prosperous European Union because the European Union is our biggest trade and economic partner. The more problems there are within the European Union, the greater the risks and uncertainties for us. Now isn't that warm and comforting for the Europeans to know that really <laughs> Russia is looking out for their interests? And if, you know, the United States wants to be against them, well, Russia will be with them. Uh, interesting. This is New York Times, June 5th. But Europe needs Russia. And this is the act of God. Where did God put the oil? He put so much of this oil in Russia that Russia is the, is the place where you buy oil, where you buy gas. And some of these nations in Europe, so cramped together, but sovereign nations need their energy to come from somewhere, and Russia's got these pipelines right at their door and developing new pipelines to make that association stronger and stronger. Nations realize that they become dependent upon Russia, but it still happens. This Nord Stream, uh, number two, which is going to Germany, being the chief case where Germany is prepared to rely on Russia for all that particular energy, and many nations are you know, wondering, what's Germany thinking of doing this? Well, if God's behind it, this is the way it will work out, that Europe will be dependent on Russia. We see Ezekiel 38 requiring that Gog of the land of Mago will bring these nations of Europe together with them. They'll be together. We don't know exactly how it will work out. We always thought it would be through oil or something that, that uh, you know, some energy that they would bring these nations together, but these facts seem to be undisputable. So the instances of Russian energy coercion are kind of interesting to read. Our nation's paying attention. The Kremlin's use of energy coercion began even before the USSR actually dissolved in September or December 1991. For instance, it interrupted oil supplies to the Baltic states in 1990 in an effort to crush the region's budding independence movements, although to no avail. Russian energy companies, presumably with the Kremlin's blessings, have gone on to make multiple attempts over the past 25 years to use energy supplies to gain leverage over Russia's neighbors 
and advance Moscow's strategic priorities. The author has identified at least 15 discrete instances where Russian entities use price and physical volume manipulation of crude oil or natural gas supplies, often amid political tensions, to pressure consumers located in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union countries. You'd really imagine when that's out there, and history would test to whether it's true or, or false, that nations would continue to work with Russian energy. But they do. And I just wanted to give you that source. Now, here's some interesting things. These escaped our attention back in the 60s. I never would have thought this. In fact, it didn't happen in the 60s. It was in the 1980s that we, we saw this happen. I'll read this. It says, the last Soviet census of 1989 indicated about 1,500,000 Jews living in the country, of which about 877,000 moved to Israel by October 2000. That's a huge population of people moving from Russia to Israel. The wave of immigration in this short period of time was the greatest influx of people to Israel since the day of its creation. Immigrants from the former Soviet Union composed 50 to 7 percent of the newcomers during that time period. And there's so many people speaking Russian in Israel that I put this picture of the writing on a manhole cover in Tel Aviv. Now you look through the writing and see if you can recognize the languages. So you would say English. You may not recognize you know, some of these other ones, but uh, you can imagine it's Hebrew. That would probably be Arabic. But the last is obviously in Russian. It'll be a manhole cover. Just what people would walk around or walk on in the street would actually have a warning for um, people who only speak Russian. This is what we're seeing. Like this picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago. So it, it shows you that here is the defense minister of Israel, Avigdor Leiberman, and Shurgi Shogu, at least that's the way I pronounce his name, <laughs> may not be right, but he's the defense minister of Russia. These get along because they both speak Russian. They both come from the former Soviet Union. Now that's kind of unique in this. That there's so many Jews in Russia or in, in uh, Israel, rather, that have come from Russia, that they, they have this sort of special relationship with Russia, and not unlike Crimea. And you sort of suspect that maybe one day that will be useful in what Russia does in its final moves. So this evil thought that Russia has in Ezekiel 38, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, upon the people that are gathered under the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and that dwell in the midst of the land. That's a verse for us, brothers and sisters. Because how could you deny that if you go through history, you don't see this, but you see it now. And you see that this nation, Israel, had to come back first before they could take the spoil of them and take it as a prey and to turn their hand upon the desolate places now inhabited. And for many years, we have thought it was because of oil. Well, what did we have to say about that in the 60s? There was no oil discovered in Israel. They thought Israel was left out like many other countries, that there just was never be any oil in Israel. They were looking for it, but they never found it. We thought it must have meant that Russia would come into the Middle East, not necessarily Israel, but come into Saudi Arabia, where there's a lot of oil come into the, the Gulf, the Persian Gulf area, where there's a lot of oil. We thought it, you know, Israel was just sort of a sideshow until they started finding it. 2009, that was the Tamar field. 2010, Leviathan. 2016, they found oil in the Golan Heights. They found the oil around Jerusalem. In 2017, they were drilling for oil in the plain of Jezreel. There's so much oil in Israel and what they have found that they say it could satisfy Americans, America's use for about 35 years. I mean, it's way out of proportion to anything like the size of the state. Why do you think they're discovering it now? 
because all these pipelines going to Europe are tying Europe to Russia. And it's interesting that they want to market this. Even Egypt's found oil, and Cyprus has found oil, and they're finding so much oil in the Eastern Mediterranean that they're thinking of, we've got to get it to a market. Where's the market? Europe. Go up from the south into Europe with their pipelines. Well, I think Russia would have a little bit to say about that. But it may be very subtle, the way it works out. Look at the players. You can see those various fields, the Leviathan field being a very big discovery in uh, Israel has made claim to, and Tamar. But you have Lebanon, you have Syria, you have Cyprus, you have Turkey, you have Egypt, all in that area, all looking for oil now, because if you can make discoveries like that close to Israel, what could you make close to us? And that's sort of the spirit of the day. That's something to watch. But it's not the only thing. Israel stands out of proportion to the world and what they've been able to do in science and in the research centers they have, in the research and development they do. Just look at the company symbols on that screen that illustrate some of the biggest companies in America. have got some kind of a, a factory or some kind of a research facility in Israel. Why would you go to Israel? Well, because a lot of the startups, a lot of the thinking, a lot of the ideas, the innovations come from Israeli minds, come through Israeli research, and they want to be there because of that. I often uh, thought of this one because this has been in the news for some years, but it was only just recently, it was uh, May 18, that, uh, no, sorry, May 31st, that we saw this in snippets that the the chief executive officer for Intel has now informed Israel that they are going to invest $5 billion in development of chips, a chip processing facility. Do you know where that is? That's in Gat, Kuryat Gat. That's Gath. That's where the Philistines used to be. That is so close to the Gaza Strip that the Gaza people in their armaments can actually shoot rockets over the top of that facility, because when they were trying to do that and, and were achieving some of it when they were shooting up the Tel Aviv. Why would a company like that want to invest in Israel at a time when there, there's sort of an act of war on the place? This is the hand of God. Like God's doing this, he's the one that's got his hand on the strings of those who are actually performing the work. And so we see these rather unique things to bring the nations of the earth to Jerusalem for the great climatical battle. But here's another one, and I want to spend a little more time in this because I didn't recognize this uh, for what it was until I just saw a few other things that have uh, been pointed out to me in, in snippets and, uh, and by others. Now, we would know if we've done a little research on the way Christianity developed, that the way it expanded, it went from I don't know which map I'll use, but you've got Rome over here. That was the first Rome, to the second Rome in Istanbul, to the third Rome in Moscow. Now that's written up in National Geographic. That's not Christadelphian interpretation. There's a third Rome. The third Rome was Moscow. So there's something religious would have been expected by that, that the Russians have had this religious background. We just didn't see it in the years of the Soviet Union because they were very anti-religious. But that's not Putin. That's not the way he's going. At least that's the, the uh, perception that you get from what he said and what he's doing. Why would the coat of arms in the Russian Federation when they chose them, 1991, when they were forming it, choose something that represented so closely the Byzantine coat of arms, which came from Constantinople, the second Rome. Russia perceives itself as the center of Christianity up there in Moscow. And are set about to try to take control of things in that sense. You will see in a way, in a, in a minute, I hope, some of the reasons why things are happening in this, in this particular area in Jerusalem. Here's the man. You would never see 
Uh, I don't think you'd even see Gorbachev in a position like that. You wouldn't see Yeltsin. You surely wouldn't see Khrushchev or Brezhnev, those former Soviet leaders in a position between two religious men. But that's the way Putin wants to be seen. He wants to be seen as Christian. So in his remarks, now this is going back to 2015, but he really doesn't seem to have changed policy at all. Continuing in his remarks, Putin stated that he has championed Russian laws that essentially outlawed abortion in Russia. No abortions after the 12th week. And before that time, in limited cases, and also the end of financial support for abortions, reversing a previous Soviet policy. Number three, strongly supporting traditional marriage, especially religious marriage, with financial aid to married couples having more than two children. Four, establish compulsory religious education. Compulsory religious education in all Russian schools. Made religious holidays, now official Russian state holidays. And instituted a nationwide program of rebuilding churches that were destroyed by the communists, and most notable being the historic Church of Christ the Savior in Moscow. He came on the scene in 2000. He's done a lot of work. There's been a lot of money spent in this. As you can see, there's that central church. That didn't look anything like the, the modern and, and rather beautiful way it's, it's constructed and ornamented back in the, in the days of the um, Soviet Union. This is the cathedral in uh, St. Petersburg, which was turned into a museum by the Soviet Union, which now is uh, also serving as uh, a cathedral. Look at the, you know, you can imagine the money that would have been spent to actually get that back in shape. But you look at this. Look at the Russian real estate in Jerusalem. Now, Sister Dorothy and I had the opportunity to go to, to Israel. We took the opportunity as the excuse of a 40th anniversary. So some years ago, we went to Israel. They just rented a car and uh, drove around and had a look with a mission. Who has the interests in Jerusalem? Look at who's there. Look at what you can see. Find out who are the ones who are the stakeholders of what's in Jerusalem to see if we can, what would be the reasons why all nations would be drawn towards Jerusalem? Well, I'll tell you, that is ornamented and, and, uh, and uh, given the, you know, the golden glitter and the beautiful colors to match anything you would find in Jerusalem. That's recent. That's the work of Putin and his rebuilding program. If you notice where it is, you can all see the Dome of the Rock in the picture. You all know that we're facing the Mount of Olives. You can see the tower on the top. But that's where the church of, of Saint Mag, or Mary Magdalene is, is found, just on the bottom of the hill of the Mount of Olives, right in that critical area of Jerusalem. That's where Russia wants to be known. That's where they want their citizens to go and visit and see the claim that Russia has to that area of the world. Now, that church of Mary Magdalene was built by the Tsar Alexander III in 1888. So, you know, John Thomas was going through the time when Russia was, was doing this kind of work in Israel. And much of the things that he wrote about Russia were reflecting what he thought would turn out to be the invasion of Israel. And then the Soviet Union just put a number of years of that on hold. And then finally, they're coming back into it. That's why I often think maybe that is what the hooks into the jaws were when they changed the government and now have taken the lead again and getting back into the land and having an influence there. But it's not just there. That building is Russian, right at the top of the Mount of Olives. It says the 64-meter tower that dominates the Mount of Olives skyline belongs to the Russian Orthodox Church of the Ascension. It was built to this height in the 1870s, so the pilgrims unable to walk to the Jordan River could climb its 214 steps and at least see the river. Interesting, isn't it, that Russia at that time took such an interest in Israel to build these things, and that now this present leader of the, of, of the Russian Federation, I keep on wanting to say the Soviet Union, I've said it so many times. No, it's a Russian Federation 
He wants to get back there and claim it. And he's laying all kinds of claims on Israel now for this. This is one that is very recent. And the news that you'll see in this relates to what happened this month. Now this Grand Duke, Sergei Alexandrovich of Russia, going back to 1857 to 1905, built this courtyard called Sergei's Courtyard in Jerusalem. And it was very beautifully uh, you know, decked out all the ways, everything that you could have for the visit of a, of a prominent prince from a foreign land. Well, I read this in the snippets, and this is where the value of the snippets, I would never have found this article otherwise, but it was just from the Times of Israel. That's May 29th. In a rare move, the Russian embassy is to host its National Day party in Jerusalem. Now, you must not forget, if, if you have been informed of this, that prior to America claiming to recognize the capital of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, a capital of Israel to be Jerusalem, the Russians had said that. But they sort of didn't go as far as the Americans said. They said it was Western Jerusalem. They wouldn't recognize that all of Jerusalem was Israel's capital. And they advocated that that city, the eastern part of Jerusalem, the old city, be part a capital for the Palestinian state. But to keep up with President Trump, in a rare move, the Russian embassy is going to host its National Day party in Jerusalem. So formerly, they have held it in some other city. It's not as if they've never done it in Israel before, but now it's being done in Jerusalem to keep up with the Americans. They're just a step behind. So I'll just go on and read what this article said. It said, in nod to Moscow's April 2017 recognition of uh, Western, a part of the city as Israel's capital, June 14th receptions to be held at the historic Sergi's courtyard. Sergi's compound, which was returned to Russia by Israel in 2008, holds a unique place in the history of the Russian presence in the Holy Land, the Russian embassy spokesman said. The decision to host the National Day reception there is not occasional. The compound symbolizes our culture, traditions, and represents a genuine allotment in Israel and the Middle East in general. That sounds like Russia's moving in. That's Jerusalem. When you see the stakeholders in Jerusalem, and you see Russia has these buildings in Jerusalem claiming them to be theirs, letting the world know by celebrating their national day in that particular dwelling, you can see that Russia's moved from just the boundaries of Israel to the boundaries of Jerusalem. And that's what Joel told us to watch for. The nations would be gathered together against Jerusalem. Does Israel like this? Well, they held it June 14th, just a couple of weeks ago. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a reception marking Russia Day in Sergei's Courtyard, Jerusalem, June 14th. There he is. Does he look worried? Does his wife Sarah look worried? He's sitting beside the Russian ambassador to Israel. Now they're, they're hand in hand with them. This is another picture of him. And he's shaking hands with a, I suppose he was a Jewish person, who was also Russian in background, with all the display of medals. And uh, this is, of course, some of the pageantry which goes on for celebrations like that. So I'll just read that little article from the Times as well. This is a holiday for Russia. It's a celebratory day that was initiated and takes place in Jerusalem. And I assume there will be many more days like this one in Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Nathieu said at the event, I know that we're going to celebrate many, many years of cooperation between Israel and Russia in Moscow and also next year in Jerusalem. Who do you think's being fooled? That's the kind of subtlety with which Russia is coming towards Israel. And you hear of, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu going off to, to Russia to speak with Putin personally. He was invited you know, to, to watch the military parade in May. He's now being, being invited to go and watch the final rugby match 
in Russia. I mean, he, he, Putin's doing everything he can to woo Netanyahu to his side. Yet, he still maintains the view that he has in going into Syria, as you'll see in other news. So, the land promised to Abraham forever is a very interesting land. He promised him the land from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. So, the Euphrates is river going down here. So, it's all that land. He promised him from the south to the river of Egypt, up into the north, and we could expect it would be up into the area above Lebanon. In fact, I think in the next slide here, I just show you the nations. You've got Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, all involved in this land which was promised to Abraham forever. For many years of my life, and I suppose many years of a number of you, we never thought of Russia actually being in that part of the country without a war. But we're seeing them not only on the borders of the land, but we're seeing them right in the city of Jerusalem. A military base established in the land of promise, Latakia, up there where there's the, the naval base, and the uh, air bases closely around it. Russian presence in the Mediterranean is there. The ships seem to be ready. The, the ways to getting in, the ports are there. It seems that Daniel's prophecy is just waiting for the, the actual run of the event. Now one thing, just two slides of importance I want to leave with you. The Russian-led forces will be destroyed by God in Israel. It's not that Russia would be destroyed in Israel. If we destroyed every, if, you know, every uh, warrior, every ship, every airplane, every bit of, of the munitions they have was destroyed, it still would be a, a nation of great power up in Russia. So the Russian-led forces will be destroyed by God in Israel. I'll call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord Yahweh. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. What weapon do the Russians have against that? What weapons do the Russians have against God withdrawing the breath of 185,000 men in one night? No bullet holes, no blood, nothing to show for it. They're just all dead in the morning. Absolutely no match for God. It doesn't matter what kind of weapons they have or how they display them or how they threaten the world with them. I'll call a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord Yahweh, every man's sword against his brother. I'll plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I'll rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. We take comfort in that. God is in control. We've said that many, many times in many public lectures. He says further in Ezekiel 39, verses 1 to 3, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince or the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Will you read that in a newer version? And there's nothing there about leaving any part of it. It's, it's just not in the original. And will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and cause thine arrows to fall out of the right hand. So what God says he will do is he will disarm them. Even with all the threatenings they have of, of advanced missiles, anti-missiles or whatever, God will disarm them. And as we read in Ezekiel 39, they will burn those weapons because it will be an age when they will learn war no more. So just in a summary slide, Russia is identified in Bible prophecy. That's a very, very strong belief Christadelphians have. It's a lever for getting people to get interested in the Bible. Any of us should be able to talk to our friends by using that fact alone. 
Russia is identified in Bible prophecy. Its work is to group nations together to fulfill the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. There'll be a guard under those nations. We can see what nations they are. We can display their flags. We can talk to people about it. They've come from those countries. Do you know your country is going to be involved in this? Russia is being moved by God to humble Israel. Israel's got a lot of things going for it. But although there is some sign of spiritual revival in Israel, there can't be any question about that, you don't see it much at the top. And certainly in the cities, you see everything in the big cities that you see in the cities here in America and in Canada. So Russia is being moved by God to humble Israel, and the time to do so is nigh at hand. Russia is able to find holes in the defenses of the Western nations to work out its agenda. The walls that are around Israel are no walls at all to a nation like Russia. They might stop the Arabs, they might stop the nations that are immediately around Israel, because it's a very walled country, but they are meaningless to a country that comes in through by helicopters or just comes in en masse and just overwhelms the defenses. But in the end, it will stand up against Yahweh and meet its demise on the mountains of Israel. We have a strong case, brothers and sisters, to hold on to our faith and to use that faith to help others see what God is doing with the nations, to attract them to his book, that they might read more about this book and learn the gospel themselves. So be it. Thank you.